Hello everyone. Uh, this is Mert Aydemir from Research Center for Iranian Studies, Istanbul. Uh, welcome to the tenth of our book presentation series. Uh, today we will be focusing on a book by Helen Thibault entitled Transforming Tajikistan, State Building and Islam in Post-Soviet Central Asia, uh, published in 2018 by IB Tauris. And the book was also translated into Turkish last year by Ketebe Publishing. The Center for Iranian Studies has been established to conduct research on Iran and Iranian affairs, and the underlying mission of the Iran is to explore and discuss social, cultural, political, and economic issues related to Iran by presenting scholarly analysis in various formats. The Iran relies on the principles of academic quality, objectivity, and responsibility. As the Iran team, we believe such a goal can only be achieved through international participation and a multidisciplinary approach. Therefore, we encourage Turkish and foreign scholars to contribute to the understanding of Persianate affairs in our academic platform. Book and thesis presentations have been a significant part of our academic agenda since the foundation of the center. With the outbreak of the pandemic, we began to organize virtual meetings with scholars from all over the world. Before we start, I would like to give, I would like to give you brief information about the structure of our events. In the first part, Dr. Thibault uh, will present her book in approximately 40 minutes. After that, uh, we will have a Q&A session. You may write your questions or comments in the chat section. Now, uh, I'm happy and honored to introduce our guest to you. Helen Thibault is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan since 2016. She holds a PhD from the University of Ottawa and a graduate degree from the Université Libre de Bruxelles. She is also a co-investigator in the Political Economy of Education Research Network. She specializes in issues of religion, gender and sexuality in Central Asia. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thibault, uh, for being with us and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to uh, present this book, uh, which I have been working on uh, for a very long time. That has been published uh, first in 2018 and then uh, translated into Turkish um, in uh, 2021. So it's it, very interesting for me to revisit this work that I've uh, started uh, doing in 2008, basically. Um, so I will present a bit of a, today the genesis uh, of the book, uh, some of the conclusions, uh, and uh, and I will be happy to uh, to talk with you. Uh, so thank you again for the invitation uh, to to present my book to the to a um, uh, Turkish audience or perhaps also international audience. Um, so I think you can already see uh, the slides that I prepared. Um, so this is um, not the photo that is on the original book, um, but this is the photo I wanted to be on the book. <laughs> uh, and the publisher, Ivy Torres, the now called Bloomsbury Publishing, refused. <laughs> so I had to propose something else, but this is, uh, I get the chance to finally show this photo. So this is a photo I took in the city of Khojan, in 2011. You will see this photo again in a presentation in a different context. Uh, but this is the unveiling, uh, which I thought was very symbolic, uh, it's because this book is about Islam. Uh, this is the unveiling of a new statue, a new national symbol for the city of Hujand, uh, which was before called Leninabad uh, in Soviet times, uh, which was renamed Hujand um, in 1998. Um, so I get just for me to get the chance to show this photo. <laughs> uh, and this is the cover of the, the Turkish book. Um, and I'm very grateful for, uh, for those who um, contacted me and introduced me uh, to, um, or proposed the idea of, um, of uh, translating the book. I think it was because of my participation uh, in a NATO conference that took place in Antalya. Uh, it was the parliamentary, NATO parliamentary um, assembly. They, they held a uh, symposium, uh, their, their annual conference in, in Antalya. Uh, and at this occasion, I was interviewed by Turkish media, uh, GTZ. Uh, and I think that's why 
somehow my my work has been known <laughs> among uh, Turkish uh, scholars. Uh, so I'm very thankful for Samir uh, Bawulu, uh, who uh, is the one who contacted me uh, about this book. And then uh, so about uh, and first an interview and then later about um, uh, as a result, the publishing of the book. Uh, and I think indeed, um, even though Tajikistan and um, Central Asia uh, overall uh, and uh, and and Turk and Turkey have uh, a lot in common. Uh, Tajikistan is, a, as as we are here for, a Persian-speaking country. So whereas the others might, as Turkic-speaking uh, countries, have more connections to uh, to Turkey culturally and historically. Uh, linguistically, of course, um, but at the same time, there are a lot of parallels that we can make uh, with uh, with Central Asia and Tajikistan and Turkey because of the secularization process that took place. Um, what we could call a very affirmative secularization process, which were, were driven those two processes driven by very different values, um, one of communism and the other one of the ideology we can call modernism yeah, in Turkey uh, and Kemalism. Um, so um, you will probably find a lot of parallels with, with Turkey uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so the genesis of the book, as I mentioned, uh, this was actually my PhD dissertation, as uh, all scholars are <laughs> sort of uh, taught into doing, uh, PhD students have in mind that when their dissertation will be completed that they can make turn into a book so this is what i did like as a typical uh, phd graduate um and i've always had a an intellectual and personal interest in central asia for i'm not sure what reason <laughs> but uh i was always interested in central asia even though i, I have no connection to the the, the region i'm from uh, quebec uh, canada uh, but I developed an intellectual interest throughout my studies in political science, thanks to a few professors. Um, I always had an interest in religious issues. Um, and I think uh, some of the arguments I made in I make in the book are actually inspired by my own family history um, as someone who lived in a household where one of my parents um, converted to a different religion when I was a child. Um, so, so this has, I think, greatly impacted the way I see religion and all the religious conflicts that emerged from this uh, and some of the tensions and the reasons why, why do people uh, become religious? Um, so this is the underlying question of the book. Um, and at the time in 2010, and I, um, when I did my first field work was 2010, but when I started my studies in 2008, um, Tajikistan was receiving a lot less attention than other countries which were more accessible at the time, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan um, and Uzbekistan to some extent before 2005. Um, but uh, Tajikistan was uh, understudied maybe because of the civil war environment made, made research very difficult. Um, so I would say the literature was uh, limited um, and Tajikistan was also very interesting because in Central Asia, this is the only place where an Islamic political party was participating uh, officially in the, in the political life of the country until 2015. So that is a particularity that really deserved a lot of attention, in my opinion. And well, I will come back on the issue of uh, the fate of the Islamic political party. Um, so basically, this I, I included a lot of photos in the in the presentation uh, for you to see. Um, maybe not all of you are familiar with what um, Tajikistan uh, looks like, <laughs> uh, and um, so these are photos. All the photos I've taken myself. Um, so my basically my question was why after independence, um, Tajikis, uh, Tajiks or Tajikistanis. Um, started practicing Islam um, increasingly. Yeah? That why did the practice of Islam really dramatically increased after independence? So in Soviet times, as we know, uh, religion was not forbidden, but it was greatly limited. Yeah? Possibilities to practice religion was greatly limited on the territory of the Tajik um, so socialist republic. Um, there were 16 mosques 
and today they are about 4,000. <laughs> so the difference is enormous, and that's the case for other other um, um, republics as well, um, and probably for the, the same case for the, the, the Armenia or Georgia, for instance. Yeah, limited number of churches uh, during Soviet times, and that number exploded after independence. So this is the underlying uh, questioning. Uh, so the research focus was to look at um, what is the legacy of the Soviet Union's uh, forced secularization in Central Asia, uh, which is a very strong legacy, not only in terms of religious um, issues, but political and social issues as well, environmental legacy. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, the, the weight, yeah, how important is this legacy? Uh, so therefore, I'm looking at governmental attitudes and practices towards this so-called religious revival. And what are the social perceptions and attitudes towards religion? Um, so my arguments, I will detail them later, but I just wanted to give a brief overview. So my arguments, I wanted to revisit the idea of ideologi ideological vacuum that we have seen a lot in the literature. So the, 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 the ideology of, the, um, of communism was so strong and so um, totalizing uh, that it left a hole. Yeah? When finally um, the USSR collapsed, and this ideology became completely obsolete. Um, and so this Soviet legacy of this holistic ideology was something I really wanted to explore. Are there connections between this, yeah, indeed, holistic ideology that was prevalent, even though people were not necessarily completely convinced communists, yeah, but they still had this idea that uh, the world should be regulated by an ideology that is that it involves that covers everything, yeah. Um, and finally, the idea that religion is important for a lot of people to make sense of their own life, uh, especially in con in a context like Tajikistan in a post-Civil uh, War country that has seen a lot of suffering uh, and, and economic problems. So religion can be considered as a way to, um, to make sense of your own life. Um, so the approach that I'm using is historical institutionalism in political science. This is a quite uh, known uh, approach uh, and that uh, emphasis, emphasizes um, the idea of path dependency. Yeah, so how the past institutions continue to shape the way things are done and institutions in formal and formal function. Um, and uh, my approach was also one of political ethnography. So I not only wanted to look at institutions, but also the way people behave in the institutional framework that they live in. Uh, how do people uh, make sense of their own lives? Um, and political ethnography is really a way of um, collecting, um, collecting narratives uh, to make to 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 assess the real and to assess the assess the reality of the people who are living there. Uh, so that includes uh, extended field work, which I did in Tajikistan in 2011 and two, uh, 2010 and 2011. I spent ten months uh, in Tajikistan in the north. I will show a map in a moment, and I conducted interviews with officials. Um, state officials who are working in institutions responsible for regulating religion, members of the Islamic Council, political parties, imams, and most importantly, probably uh, with um, uh, ordinary citizens um, in order to see what is the meaning, what was the meaning of, of their own religious uh, lives and their own religious beliefs. So both religious and secular. Uh, although, again, there's no strict dichotomy between who is religious, who is, uh, because people claim religious identities, but what they, uh, the meaning and their practices are very different, as we will see in a moment. Um, so this is <clears throat> a political map of um, Tajikistan. Uh, so Tajikistan is a very mountainous country, landlocked. Um, and uh, I conducted my field work, as I mentioned, in the north, in the city of Khujand. Uh, very much influenced by uh, Uzbek culture. There are many uh, Uzbek minorities living in this region as well, 
as well as Kyrgyz minorities, um, since it is also neighboring Kyrgyzstan. Um, at the time, the border with Uzbekistan was still closed, uh, but now there are a lot more uh, connections since the death of uh, Islam Karimov and the, the new president, Mirzoyoyev, changed uh, improved relations between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Um, Tajikistan is neighboring um, Afghanistan. It has a very long border that a lot of scholars write about. Um, but uh, even though Tajiks and, and uh, northern Af uh, Afghanis, who are in a uh, great majority also Tajiks, the connections between the two people, the two nations are, are limited, I would say, to commercial ties. Um, they are, especially for people from the north, where I did my field work. So people um, look up to Russia as uh, their uh, sort of brothers, perhaps more than they do for Afghanis. So and that's a very interesting legacy of the Soviet Union again. Um, and this is a photo of a magnificent mosque uh, in, the, in the city of Rujand. Um, just to show you an overview, this has been restored um, after independence. And the northern region, I must say, was untouched by the civil war, almost so. No fighting took place there, so there was no uh, lim very limited destruction because of the war. Um, this is another uh, fo photo I really like, showing two women, uh, two sisters, who are um, embracing each other after one came back from the Hajj. So the Hajj, I will come back to this. Uh, has become very popular. Tajikistan fills its quotas for the pilgrimage to Mecca every year. Uh, there's a selection process for this, uh, so this has become quite popular as well. Uh, this is a photo of the RPT's office in Hujand, uh, which, uh, so the RPT is the Islamic Revival Party of Tajikistan, which was legal until 2015. So I've conducted, I spent a lot of time in this office, which today does not exist anymore. The office has been destroyed by the authorities uh, after the party was banned in 2015. So this is a historical picture of something that no longer exists, of a distant past. Uh, these are photos of, again, of Khujand. As I mentioned, it was called Leninabad uh, in Soviet times, and th there was a gigantic statue of Lenin uh, there until 2018. It was replaced. Uh, by uh, the new national hero, um, who is Ismaili Somoni, uh, regarded as the founder of the Tajik nation and the founder of the Samanid Empire. Uh, Empire. Um, so that's quite interesting to see the contrast. Uh, it took them actually quite long to change the statue, yeah, and up until 2011. Uh, the statue of Lenin has been relocated. It hasn't been uh, destroyed, but it's no longer the main square. Uh, it's in a, a suburban park close to the city. Um, so uh, I will go very quick uh, here, Tajikistan at glance. Uh, today, Tajikistan has 9 million inhabitants, 97% Muslims. Um, and it's a multi-ethnic country, mostly populated by Tajiks, um, but also Uzbeks in the north, as I mentioned. 4% um, uh, others, Russian, Kyrgyz, Uyghurs. Um, I forgot to mention, I cannot mention all of them, but um, uh, it's multi-ethnic in that sense. Um, <clears throat> Uh, quite uh, uh, in great majority, people uh, follow Sunni Islam, but there's also a uh, religious minority in the in the south, the in the Badakhshan region, which is bordering Afghanistan. So five percent of the population are Ismaili, and they mostly live in this region, Badakhshan. Um, the terrain, as I mentioned, is very uh, uh, mountainous. Uh, and it's a problem for T Tajikistan's economy uh, because of difficult access to most of the territory and difficulty to exploit some of the resources of the of, um, of the soil. Uh, border with Afghanistan, which, as you can imagine, is a bit problematic for the Tajikistani uh, authorities uh, because of well, the instability uh, south of the border, but also the drug trade. Uh, Tajikistan has a very weak economy, uh, ha very high reliance on migrants' remittances, one of the highest in the world, uh, probably the second highest uh, dependence on remittances in the world. Uh, increasingly uh, repre repressive government, uh, the pre current president has been in power since 1992, so that's uh, already a very long time. And uh, his son is uh, probably uh, set to become the next president. Uh, that would be the second 
dynasty in Central Asia, as the, the other one uh, in Turk Turkmenistan has been established last, last week with uh, Serdar Berdi Muhammadov becoming uh, the new president uh, of Turkmenistan. Uh, we will probably see a similar uh, scenario in, in Tajikistan um, in, the, in the next few years. Um, so I want to um, now go into really uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the core of the book. Um, so um, as I mentioned earlier, so I was very interested in seeing how uh, the Soviet legacy impacts um, the way the, the way people understand religion in uh, in Tajikistan. So uh, a great part of the book is dedicated to um, the, the, the the, the secularization campaigns in uh, in Tajikistan uh, or in Central Asia, but um, and 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 of course in Tajikistan. So um, of course the, the 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 secularization campaign was greatly um, influenced by Marxist atheism of the Bolsheviks, which the Bolshevik, Bolsheviks were promoting. So religion is seen as a source of um, uh, as a, as a the, the famous uh, Marx. Uh, quote right that uh, religion is the opium of, uh, of the people um, that religions encourage submission and they are exploitative uh, the religion persists because of insufficient education and material advancement and with um, with development with economic development and, and 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 widespread education religious beliefs will disappear um, and there's actually a strong connection, right? Oh, if you look all around the world, between the level of education and and uh, material well-being and religious beliefs, they tend to uh, correlate negatively. Um, um, but the the difference with uh, the, the the sort of the well, I wouldn't say natural, but the the process of secularization we have seen in uh, other countries that was not forced uh, here is different because it was a political project, yeah, and historical materialism can actually provide, can replace religion um, uh, as a provider of meaning, yeah? Um, so, and um, again, so some of the posters are, are quite interesting uh, here. So we, in the literature, we, we refer to this as Soviet social engineering, right? That uh, there is a willingness to transform the societies, uh, the, to transform societies and, 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 and work on, uh, I mean, the goal is for religious beliefs to decline because religious beliefs are in the way of progress, as we see in this in this um, uh, propaganda image. Um, and um, the, the 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 efforts were um, the efforts to um, they not only increase well-being uh, and uh, and edu ed education levels was also also coupled with very uh, very important anti-religious propaganda so again here on one of the slides it says um religion is uh is poison yeah uh so the the old lady uh is trying to bring her little uh granddaughter probably uh to church but all she wants to do is go to school and be educated and and fly planes or i don't know what uh yeah contribute to Aviation, yeah, the, the development of aviation. The other one is uh, allegedly Yuri Gagarin, who the first Soviet and the first man to go to, to space and discovers that he's been there and there is no God. Yeah, so basically the saying says, there is no God, I've been there, there's no God. So these are just uh, fun, relatively amusing examples but of uh, atheist propaganda, but the USSR secularization campaigns were, were very harsh and um, and uh, very repressive. Um, uh, so, uh, but uh, the message at the beginning was a bit emancipating for Muslims, yeah, who uh, were told by by Bolsheviks that uh, they have been oppressed by Imperial Russia, uh, and that uh, their religion was not um, recognized. Although we could say there was a lot more religious freedom in in, in White Russia in, in the Russian Empire than there was in the USSR. But at the beginning, there was a, a bit of an emancipating message, also for uh, uh, nationalism, yeah, nationalist uh, issues. Um, so it was attractive, this message, to some people. Uh, but there was very fierce resistance, right, to the uh, the Russian uh, 
the Red Army and, 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 and Bolshevik Soviet expansion in Central Asia. So some of the regions were not pacified uh, until uh, the 1930s. Um, but the USSR uh, campaign, I mean, the Soviet campaign for secularization started very early. So in 1917, recognition of civil marriages, religious marriages are no longer, no longer recognized. Uh, official separation of church and state in 1918. Collectivizations uh, led to uh, the led to the fact to the, the, the uh, as a consequence of collectivization, all the religious endowments that mosques had as land or even farms, perhaps, um, well, they were eliminated because of collectivization. And already in 1929, we see the law on religious associations. Um, that, as we will see later, is still um, used today almost with the same name by a lot of Central Asian republics. So this law on religious education, on the religious association, has a, is still a quite a strong legacy. Um, so in the 1930s, so we see uh, uh, in the 1920s there were a lot of back and forth between uh, repression and and some accommodation because there was too much resistance. Uh, but in 1930s, which is um, the Great Terror uh, started with Stalin, um, uh, we see a lot of uh, full-fledged repression. Uh, in 1959, uh, the topic of uh, scientific atheism was introduced into higher education. It was a mandatory topic. So full-fledged, again, propaganda accompanied by, by repression. Uh, what is interesting and that also has repercussions in, in, in today's Tajikistan uh, and as well as other republics uh, was the, the um, uh, focus on women, how the fight against religion was also uh, was strongly uh, associated with the liberation of women, uh, women who were oppressed by, um, by, uh, by both society and, and their own family. So the objective was to ensure, which is a noble objective, right, to ensure the equality of rights for men and women, but also uh, a political objective to undermine the Islamic clergy and religious traditions. Um, so again, there was a, quite an appeal to Muslim women um, to, to participate in the revolution and, and in the, the building of a new communist society. Um, so I believe this is a um, uh, Uzbek uh, that we see um, at the at the bottom, written in the still uh, Arabic or Persian alphabet, um, and we see what we have uh, in uh, we see that in um, in the 1930s the hujum, yeah, the assault on the veil. Uh, this is a photo of uh, Samarkand, I believe, um, and uh, so women, as we can see, are fully covered. I guess this applied to this kind of. Attire was a characteristic of mostly of urban women, not necessarily of rural women, uh, but uh, but yes. So and you will have make a parallel with the narratives today about uh, women's veiling in contemporary Tajikistan. Uh, so Islam in the USSR, uh, we could summarize this as a, um, a carrot and stick approach. Um, that there was a repression of unregistered clergy. Uh, there was the message of propaganda that Islam and all religions are backward and sexist, uh, repression of believers, uh, atheist propaganda. But at the same time, there was a um, facilitation to some extent of, of religious life, uh, which was under strict guidance of the state, um, uh, with uh, formal institutions that were meant at promoting religious values. Um, so, and the, that's why an official clergy called SADUM, this is the uh, Russian acronym, SADUM, uh, was created in 1943 in Uzbekistan. So this is the, uh, the spiritual administration of Central Asian Muslims was created in 1948. Um, some of the messages that were promoted by, religious, by, by clerics at the time was that there was a, it seems a bit schizophrenic, but there was a, a connection between Islam and socialism, because Islam is also a, re, uh, um, a religion that promotes solidarity, humanism, uh, progress, science. Uh, so, so there was this um, double rhetoric here. Um, uh, the Sadum was also a, um, um, a way for 
for the USSR to promote its diplomacy, its dipl uh, strengthened its demo, 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 diplomatic ties with Muslim countries, um, and to appear as a um, as a country that uh, promotes uh, religious tolerance. Yeah, so this institution was important for legitimacy purposes abroad and at home. Um, I'll go very quick here. Um, I'll, I'll pass that. This is a, a photo of the Sadum, but I'm not sure which the year was the photo. Uh, the source I found did not mention it. Um, but this was established in the 1940s and a religious education was formally established also. There was a medrese in Bukhara as well. Um, and um, I'm going very quick because I don't want to do the entire uh, history of the USSR. Uh, but uh, we can say that the um, this legacy is institutionalized Islam legacy. Again, we also see uh, connections with Turkey, which also has a, an established uh, clergy, official clergy, um, um, has uh, consequences, repercussions today. So throughout the 1960s and 70s, this institution remained intact with more or less repression, by, depending on, on the era and on the, the the first uh, secretary of the USSR, depending on the leader. So there were more repression campaign and a lot of back and forth. Um, so, uh, but my point was to um, show that these institutions remain quite important today in, in post-Soviet Tajikistan. Um, so I will go very quick here again um, and not do the entire history of the civil war, but the civil war uh, in Tajikistan started in 1992 and ended in 1997. Uh, and it's important because it's often seen as a um, as a, a religious war, but it was more a regional war than anything else. I think all scholars have demonstrated that. But the reason why it was it's often labeled as a religious conflict is that one of the parties of the war was the United Tajik opposition, which was mostly represented by people um, from the Islamic Revival Party of Tajikistan. Uh, which was created uh, in the uh, early days of independence and fought the, the government of Tajikistan. So that's a, an entire literature on, on civil war, and I don't want to get into this, but um, unprecedented uh, mobilization and demonstrations uh, in Dushanbe. I did not take this photo. I, I mentioned that all photos were taken by me, but obviously I didn't take this one. I wasn't there. Um, so, but uh, that's, that's quite interesting to see the level of mobilization uh, that we have seen, and the level of of uh, political diversity that has so far never been repeated since the 1990s, where many parties participated in the first presidential elections, for instance. So the reason why the civil war is significant is because it led to the uh, signing of a peace agreement in 1997 uh, between uh, Imam Ali Rahman, uh, who was already president at the time, and Said Abdullah Nouri, who was the who is the founder, uh, the late Said Abdullah Nouri, he died in 2004, I suppose, or 2006, I don't remember. Um, and uh, so this was uh, he was the founder of the Islamic Revival Party, yeah. Uh, and because of this specific peace agreement, the Islamic Revival Party was legalized, and some of its members were given. Uh, the peace agreement mentioned 30% of all ministerial positions to the opposition. That never happened, uh, but they were still present in the parliament for many years, uh, um, and there was a reciprocal pardon, so they were not prosecuted for, for their involvement in the civil war. Um, and the fighters also uh, joined regular uh, security forces and armed forces. So that's, uh, that was a peace agreement that was very inclusive. Uh, and that did not last very long. Uh, and um, so the Islamic uh, party was, um, uh, did not uh, play a significant role uh, in, in politics. It was dominated by the Rahman family. Um, and, uh, and even though it was uh, quite a, a quite, had a quite secular program, uh, it was always accused of being um, a fanatical party. Uh, it was slowly marginalized um, and uh, finally it was um, it was banned in 2015. So I will go very quickly here uh, to focus on um, they had a female presidential candidate representing them so the own leader of the party did not 
participate, uh, did not run for the elections of, on this particular e elections. Unfortunately, this candidate could not uh, gather the required 210,000 signatures necessary to become a presidential candidate, which is quite a lot. I think it's a similar number as Turkey, but Turkey has 10 times more citizens. <laughs> so the law in Tajikistan is a bit um, uh, complicated. Uh, Mohidin Kabiri is now the uh, Islamic Revival Party of Tajikistan. He went into exile in June 2015, just before the party was accused of uh, organizing a coup um, by this uh, the, this uh, former um, general um, uh, who was allegedly associated with uh, the party, which the party denies. Uh, but uh, then the the party was banned officially uh, in 2015 and put on the list of um, of uh, extremist organizations. Uh, many of its members are still in prison today. Uh, Zafarul Rahmani, she was in prison uh, for a short period of the time. She's the only one who was released, I uh, believe, because she's a woman. Um, and uh, Muhammad uh, Ali Khait uh, is still vice president of the RPT. He's uh, still in prison today. Uh, these are photos I took uh, when I attended at uh, their 2010 uh, uh, conference of the party. They had guests from from abroad. Uh, here we see some Russian and uh, Russian journalists on the right. Um, uh, some uh, intellectuals, Kabiri is there. Turajan Zoda uh, with the long beard is also a very famous Islamic cleric. Uh, one person here was uh, the uh, you see Gaidar Jamal. He was a uh, uh, Islamic Russian scholar. Uh, was also there present, and there is also a, a, a representative from the from the government. Uh, so, and that is a very again a historical photo that uh, of something that will never happen again, and that showed that because Tajikistan was once tolerant of of uh, political plurality, but it's a past that is over now. Uh, other photos, uh, repression continues uh, today of the RPT. Um, I wanted to mention uh, some of the Soviet legacy. This is a picture from Istarafshan um, uh, in the north of Tajikistan again. So we see today also a uh, very strong legal control. Uh, the Council of Ulemas uh, has replaced the Sadum. We have a Committee of Religious Affairs, which is also uh, an institution inherited from the Soviet Union. Uh, we have a long list of uh, ban organizations, indiscriminate uh, repression of believers, uh, long prison sentences for those who are accused of extremism. Uh, the Islamic clergy um, is, um, we can say, co-opted again, like we see in Soviet times. And um, there's even um, the, the, the Council of Ulemas is responsible for writing sermons. Uh, so imams cannot write their own sermons. They have to use the official one. Uh, so And they are trained by the Islamic, uh, imams are trained and selected. Uh, and they also have a uniform, as you can see on the, on the photo here. So that's, it's very formal. Um, there's an address of the website here. They also pro provide guidance to believers, even online. There's a, there's a chat that people can use. This is the current uh, Kazi, um, who's been in position for uh, at least 10 years now. Um, um, and they have some uh, legitimacy issues uh, because of their um, connection with the government, their, their uh, so-called co-optation. Um, and, uh, for instance, they have not condemned the hijab ban in schools. Um, uh, that, uh, that has been very controversial uh, in Tajikistan. Um, again, a, the, the, I, I mentioned the 1929 law on religious organizations and freedom of conscience. We have a similar law that was uh, re-emphasized or re adopted with uh, new uh, amendments in 2019. Uh, so it limits the number of mosques to be erected, uh, interdiction of proselytism. The law on parental responsibility was very controversial. It forbids minors to uh, attend religious services. And so are women. Women in Tajikistan do not have a space to uh, pray in mosques. So that's one um, very strong infringement on religious rights of women. Uh, the list of um, organizations, band organizations, mostly all of them are are um, uh, Muslim uh, 
oriented, except for two. Uh, religious education is very uh, controlled. In 2010, when I did my field work, there were six, six uh, medrases, and there only one. There's only one now, in the entire country. So religious education is uh, is complicated. Um, repression of believers. Men, uh, some men in the early 2010s were for, uh, arrested and detained for ha having long beards, and they were forcibly shaved. Uh, there are also um, some hijab patrols, hijab patrols, for instance, in bazaars. Um, and um, I'll try to be quick. I, I've run a little bit longer than, than I wanted to. I've already spoken for 40 minutes, I think. But uh, it's um, a pity because uh, the, 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 what I wanted to mention at the very end uh, was uh, actually some of the field works I conducted with ordinary citizens and what... Um, what are their understanding of religion? So a lot of people I interviewed um, were born uh, and raised in the USSR. So when I met them in 2010, they were in their 40s uh, and 30s. Um, and they were not raised in religious families, but they discovered. Yeah. So I call them, uh, perhaps a bit um, controversially, born again. So born, born again Muslims. So people who discovered religion late in life. Um, and there's a great contrast between what they they saw themselves as, as they saw themselves previously and today as sinners. Yeah. So men would typically say, "I was drinking, smoking, and sleeping around," which I no longer longer do because I discovered religion. Uh, so for them, it was a way to fill the vo fill the void somehow. Yeah, a way of being into the world and to affirm a superior. Uh, behavior, uh, superior moral behavior, in a, in a society that is extremely corrupt, and they live. Um, Tajikistan is a very corrupt and um, unequal society, and uh, people were seeing themselves by following uh, a strict religious um, lifestyle. They were seeing themselves as morally superior in a world that they perceive as really unfair and corrupt. Um, so, but uh, being religious is problematic uh, because um, you attract too much attention for the, from the authority. So here is a uh, page 162 of the uh, English book. Um, so my interlocutor is asking me how I, how I am and he says, well, you're always fine because you're not Muslim. You don't have problems. I have problems because I am Muslim. Uh, and some of the other quotes here um, about how uh, people feel per persecuted uh, by their own beliefs, um, that they feel that they don't fit in, in the categories, that the, they, do, they are not respected by the authorities because, um, because they, they are not the type of Muslims that the, the state uh, wants, to, wants them to be. Um, so, so that was a very interesting, and there was a lot of um, rage uh, against uh, some uh, uh, from from some of the the people I interviewed because they felt they were discriminated against for being Muslims in a country that is a major Muslim majority country, um, and there were also conflicting values. Uh, secular people would see Muslim as a threat, and again, this is might be a legacy of the Soviet Union that people. Um, uh, saw uh, religious be behavior as something that uh, is not desirable, yeah, something that is threatening their own their own world. Um, and uh, but some of them uh, and some of them just didn't understand. Even though, so the second quote is from someone who considered himself Muslim, uh, but uh, was very upset and 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 afraid of those who were living a, a strict religious lifestyle. Uh, but but then again, uh, some Muslims were uh, intolerant of of others who were not. So the third quote is about yeah, what kind of Muslims do they think they are? Yeah, they they drink alcohol, they don't wear hijabs. So there were there are definitely a lot of religious conflicts um, in uh, in Tajikistan over what it means to be Muslim. Uh, but uh, the first quote also says that uh, again, that's interesting that the Muslims themselves emphasize this. I'm I'm, a, I'm I'm an honest person. I'm a, I'm a believer and I'm an honest person. But some Russians also, for instance, Russians that they were non-Muslims, um, um, they were saying you should go uh, to them. Yeah, they are God-fearing. They are 
they're not going to cheat you with prices. Uh, so that was quite interesting. So there's also some positivity associated with um, religiosity. Um, so, um, and we can discuss this, uh, I'm running out of time, but we can discuss this uh, again, but there is strong, again, parallel with the secularization campaign of the USSR and um, the government's actions um, on uh, issues of head covering and, and, um, and hijab. So the Tajikistan has, has forbidden women to wear uh, hijabs in, in, uh, in schools, and they have also published a, a dress code. So this, was, this is an official publication by the Ministry of Culture in, in 2018 of how to properly, properly dress. So again, we see a lot of parallels with the Soviet legacy of emancipation of women, which who should not be uh, too religious. So here we have different types of attires, professional for teenagers and for celebrations. Uh, and a lot of people are asking, so what is tradition, right? So um, again, if you remember, so how women were covered in Uzbekistan in, in the early, before the revolution. Uh, so if they say we have to wear traditional clothes, then, then what is traditional? So this kind of attire was traditional to the region. So when they mean tradition, they mean the Soviet understanding of tradition. So people are questioning that. Um, so I'll stop here. Um, and um, so I think I've laid out uh, some of the conclusions uh, already. So this is just a, uh, a summary, but um, so yeah, 46 minutes, not too bad. Um, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if they are. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Thibault. Uh, I think uh, it was a great uh, presentation uh, for me and it was very insightful and informative as a, for me at least because I, I didn't know uh, much thing about Tajikistan and I now, now I feel myself uh, like competent even <laughs> uh, in, especially about the legacy of Soviet uh, period and also uh, the post-Soviet period. Uh, I can read aloud the questions if, if we have I will uh, check them uh, later but uh, before that, I would like to mention some of the points uh, that you, you have raised or, the, or I, I may ask some questions. Uh, first thing that first thing that I that attracted my attention was the similarity of the Tajik and Turkish uh, like experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I got this sense, uh, this kind of impression when I was reading your book and like what what uh, what was going on today's in nowadays in uh, Tajikistan was very much similar to the like early Republican Turkey in the especially during the 1930s and uh, because both the states uh, were not overtly uh, atheist or they didn't expose the atheist policies as far as I concern and uh, but they just they create the sense of uh, particular Islam the kind of innocuous Islam, if I may use this term, like Islam that wouldn't harm the national like, unity or national order, social order. Uh, this parallelism is very uh, striking. Uh, and if we think that the two, the populations of two countries are Hanafi, essentially, not all, all uh, the population I mean, but maybe <laughs> there is something to do with this Hanafi legacy, I don't know. Uh, also, uh, I would like to I would like you to elaborate on your uh, methodology. It was very attractive for me the, the so-called neo institutional ethnography. So, do you think that uh, this methodology can be extended to the other geographies, uh, not just Soviet uh, like Soviet uh, geography? Uh, how would you say that? Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I. Uh, Historical institutionalism is something that can be used in any context, yeah? And it's convenient because you can uh, focus on formal institutions, yeah? Like um, laws, yeah, uh, parliaments, uh, I mean, yeah, formal institutions, um, as well as informal. So in my case, um, so what I did in terms of the informal, so there was one moment that was very interesting, is that uh, one of my uh, informants, he was very religious, but also 
turn religious very late in his life. Um, and um, he was uh, proposing me to, I was subjected to a lot of conversion efforts. Um, actually, I have, I don't know, uh, it was uh, visible in one of the slides, but I have an article also about this, about uh, gender and faith in political ethnography. You might also be interested in that. Um, but uh, where I discuss a lot of the conversion attempts and marriage attempts <laughs> that uh, that I encountered during my fieldwork. Um, so, and what was interesting is that, again, coming back to informal institutions, is as this man was trying to convince me to, to become Muslim. Uh, and he was telling me, uh, just try a little bit. Yeah, try a little bit every day and then it will come to you. Uh, and then, but he said, he, he said, he came with a warning. He said, be careful because Islam is a very, um, uh, in Russian, he used the word a surrounding uh, a, uh, um, a religion that uh, has a, a lot of rules about how to behave. Um, and he said how to eat, how to pray, when to pray, when to clean yourself. So uh, in a sense, of the, it offers a lot of guidance. Yeah, uh, And then so later, uh, a few days later, or maybe a few weeks later, he, he told me, uh, I asked him if he missed the Soviet Union, um, anything that he missed about the, the USSR times. And he said, no, I didn't like it then because... We were told what to do, when to do something, what to study. Uh, and this was extremely interesting for me because he was telling me basically he didn't like being told what to do, but uh, that Islam tells him what to do, but he's completely fine with it. And he wants to to follow the rules yeah, uh, of the religion. So that was quite interesting. So historically, institutionalism can be used for assessing also informal institutions. Um, and whereas it's and and the way pe how people manage, yeah, to make rational. I mean, they're not completely controlled by the environment. They make rational decisions within um, the the structures they live in. Uh, so, and I think it, in, indeed it can be used in, in different contexts. And it's it's um, yeah, it's also a quite a versatile approach to to studying behavior, yeah, political or social behavior. Um, so yeah, definitely very uh, very versatile. Yeah, thank you, thank you for your for your uh, uh, like uh, answer. And I, I agree with you on the impact of institutions on the human behavior, political behavior. I think they are they they have been very influential. And as to the impact of the Soviet ideology, your example uh, that the Lenin structures uh, sculpture was. Uh, was right there until the very recent years. I think this this was one of the ex, uh, like representative examples that show the uh, impact of Soviet legacy. It's like continues, and it was very interesting for me because I expect uh, from the Central Asian peoples to deny the Soviet legacy. Maybe they overtly deny, but uh, in reality, they uh, still that they. Per perpetuate the Soviet practices. Uh, so it, it was very interesting for me. Uh, like Soviet legacy uh, after the Soviet period, uh, one one may expect a, a kind of radical denial, but I think the reality is vice versa, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, and it also applies to the cult of personality, yeah, that ah. we see in many regions of the former Soviet Union, including Russia, right? Um, uh, I don't think there are many statues of Putin uh, in uh, in Russia, uh, but uh, but we cannot deny that there's a strong uh, cult of personality, and that's the case in in all Central Asian countries. Maybe not Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Turkmenistan is the the, the most uh, emblematic example of this cult of personality, uh, which is uh, yeah over the top. Uh, but uh, and in Kyrgyzstan because of the the so so-called revolutions they had there, there is less of this cult of personality. The presidents never last very long uh, there, but uh, we can definitely see it uh, also in Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and uh, and Uzbekistan to some extent. Um, so this is a, could be a legacy of, of the, the communist times as well with the cult personality around Lenin, uh, for instance. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's also interesting. 
the other question by me. Uh, I noticed that the symbols like a man's beard and women's hijab have been important in, in the strife between the two parties in uh, Tajikistan. So this is the, my question are, gonna, are not going to be about like the, your book, that the topic, topics that your book uh, deals with, but what about the intellectual sphere? If you can elaborate, uh, what about the strife among the intellectuals in the Islamic side and the secular side? Can, or do we see a kind of strife that we, we see in social life or this is this is not another story hmm, that's a that's a good question um i think there was uh some uh theological debates mm -hmm. uh until recently uh but that again they are being also repressed so um scholars can easily be accused of not being hanafi for instance and that happened to uh, one of the uh, scholars who was on one of the photos, Tura John Zoda. So he comes from, um, he is a respected Muslim scholar in, uh, in Tajikistan. So was his brother, who was an imam at a mosque. But they did indeed have a, um, some conflicts with uh, the, the Kazi, uh, the, 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 the head of the Council of Ulemas. Um, and uh, they were uh, the mosque of one of the Turajan Zada brothers was was closed down on uh, on on uh, accusations of not being Hanafi. Uh, so I think uh, religious dissension is also being uh, quite repressed uh, in Tajikistan, and uh, the the religious discourses have have been monopolized by by the Council of Ulemas. But again, probably like in Soviet times, uh, I mean I haven't studied. Um, this for 10 years now, <laughs> so I'm not necessarily up to date uh, with that, but I would say there's a, there's a lot of uh, censorship happening. Um, but maybe there are dissident voices within the Council of Ulemas, and not everyone has the same opinion. Um, but what is interesting that uh, there was an article published by um, Shachnoza Nazimova and Tim Epkan Hans. Uh, they actually uh, looked into some of the advice that are provided by the Council of Ulemas on their website, right? So they are anonymous, you can ask a question, and, and, um, and then they provide, the Council of Ulemas can provide answers. Um, and some of their positions were extremely conservative, uh, to a point that some would argue that these are close to Salafism, yeah? So... So that's quite interesting because Salafism is forbidden in Tajikistan. So even though Salafism is not an organization, so the, 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 that's a bit uh, ambiguous, right? To, so how do you define Salafism? No, very rarely do people claim to be Salafis. Yeah, No one claims this identity. They are just being accused of being Salafis and, and dangerous. Yeah, Salafism is not necessarily violent, but it can be. Um, but uh, so yes, that's an ambiguous part of the law. For instance, in Kazakhstan, Salafism is not forbidden. It's not a crime. Yeah, it's not considered a crime because it's too hard to define according to the Kazakhstani government. But that being said, so some of the positions uh, of the Council of Ulemas was considered quite uh, quite conservative and close to very conservative Islam or Salafism. Uh, so that's interesting. So they might there are obviously some. Um, uh, debates within the Council of Ulimas, but um, I'm not necessarily up to date with them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, answer. And my last question um, is the secular regime in Tajikistan uh, accuses uh, the religious people and Islamists uh, of being like radical or, or of having radical inclinations. I mean, terrorism. I, if I if I'm not uh, mistaken, so do you see a kind of inclinations towards radicalization, terrorism in Tajikistan uh, among the uh, religious people, or among the Islamists, Islamist Islamist party, or you don't expect such a thing? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and uh, there's also a lot of literature on on issues of Islamic radicalism uh, in Central Asia and the securitization of Islam. Uh, securitization of Islam in the sense that um, Islam is seen as a threat, right, um, and and becomes a source of public danger, uh, and that's why religion, like in Soviet times, has to be kept under control because otherwise it it can become dangerous. Religious elements will use it to promote their um, on uh, anti-systemic views, for instance. Um, and <clears throat> if we look, if you look at the the number of the instances of violence in Tajikistan in the last few years, there were um, definitely uh, attacks perpetrated by uh, groups that that can be uh, labeled as a radical Islamist, um, but they are limited. Uh, the most violence that we have seen in Tajikistan in the last 15 years is more connected to regional violence, again, like in the civil war. So the southern region of Badakhshan, uh, close to Afghanistan, has seen a lot of political instability in 2012, in 2015, uh, and again uh, in 2021. Uh, there was recent instability there and violence, protests, and the, the army had to intervene. The same uh, is for um, uh, the, the Rasht Valley, 2010, uh, where the, an army uh, uh, garnison was, uh, which was traveling was attacked um, and and it uh, one month violence ensued again um, and but most of the violence in in Tajikistan is is regional yeah so it it, it is the result of regional clans fighting for the control of their own sector of the economy for instance and a lot of violence is said to be also fought especially in Badakhshan over the drug trade because this is the bordering region with, with Afghanistan. So they're definitely, we, I don't want to deny the fact that they are radical Islamists and they were responsible for the, the death of foreign tourists uh, who were stabbed uh, by um, Tajiks who pledged allegiance to uh, the Islamic State. Uh, so that is, of course, very worrisome. Yeah, uh, I, I think six uh, tourists uh, died um, in this attack. In this attack, uh, there was also um, an attack uh, within the prison uh, in 2017, I believe, which resulted in the death of almost 30 people. It, it was something quite uh, dramatic. Uh, and uh, those um, uh, accused of organizing the, 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 the rebellion were uh, allegedly affiliated with ISIS. So, um, but uh, prison... Uh, revolts are common in Tajikistan. Uh, this is not the first time it has happened. It happened also in 2010. There was a major prison break. Um, prison conditions in Tajikistan are absolutely terrible. Um, and uh, it's actually, it can be a recruiting ground for, uh, because there's so many Islamists who are jailed. So this can be counterproductive because they can uh, recruit more people there. Uh, and the people who are in prison uh, probably um, very, very uh, angry at the government, so uh, and it creates a, a even more frustration from from the from the prisoners. Um, but um, and we cannot also neglect the fact that a lot of Tajiks, Tajikistanis, joined the uh, Islamic State in 2014, 15. There were around five five to seven hundred Tajikistanis who joined ISIS. But that's an interesting fact as well. So. How does did ISIS manage to recruit people who don't even speak Arabic uh, to join a fight that is not theirs? Uh, so, and and that's a puzzle that a lot of scholars are also trying to, to figure out. And why aren't these people organizing militarily or in their own country? Why do they go to the Middle East, yeah, to take part in this war that they have nothing to do with, basically? So. Uh, but there's an appeal there, and the number seems quite significant. But it's actually uh, 700 people from the, from a country of nine million is 
is not neglectable. Um, and where are they now is, is the question. Yeah, have they come back? Um, Kazakhstan has a very good program of de-radicalization and, and um, uh, from of the people who join ISIS who are coming back, Jusan, it's called. I think the Kazakhstani government should be praised for that program. And that seems to be working quite well with uh, women, mostly women and children who are coming back. Uh, but uh, Tajikistan's efforts have not been has not been have not been as um, significant as as Kazakhstan. So, but it's indeed worrisome. Yeah, where are they now? Uh, those Tajikistanis are they still there? Have they been killed? Are they now with ISIS in Afghanistan or the ISIL, the Levant? Um, uh, not the Levant. The, uh, how do they call themselves? I forgot. Uh, ISIS in uh, in uh, Khorasan, ISIS K, ISIS uh, Islamic State in Khorasan. Um, so, so there are reasons to be worried about radical Islam, but I would say the most of the violence is, is non-religious. Very interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your time and effort uh, for this event. Um, it was a great pleasure and honor for me uh, to be the host of this event. I think you have covered a lot of uh, subjects and uh, our discussion is also very like uh, fruitful for me at least and i'm sure that for the audience also was also like that and um, we may uh, take your concluding remarks if any or mm -hmm. you, may, you may talk about your like future projects uh i hope mm -hmm. we can post you in turkey even <laughs> so yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's not that far. Um, that would be that would be great. Um, no, I just want to thank you again for for inviting me to this event and the, the, giving me the, uh, the opportunity to revisit my book, which I was uh, written already a long time ago. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Okay, then we can uh, end uh, today's event. For those who who are interested in more, you, uh, they can uh, read your book in English or in Turkish. Mm -hmm. So uh, for today, I think uh, we have we are done. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you. All. you. See you.